Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking about AMD's announcement of the 6700 XT announcement. That's, that's, that's what it was announced. The, the announcement was announced. This is commonly what happens. We'll also be talking about the Taiwan literal drought affecting the semiconductor drought, going through some new server technology and offerings from Gigabyte and Toshiba. We'll be talking about uh, some semiconductor engineering advancements from a process technology standpoint as well, so some wider industry news. And separately, and this is an important one, about the hardware unboxed, uh, we'll call it shadow ban, involving YouTube. And more on that in this video especially. That's an important story. Before that, this video is brought to you by Corsair and their 5000D Airflow. The Corsair 5000D Airflow is an ATX tower with high material build quality and a focus on cooling performance with attention paid to small details. The case has a unique look with deeply indented cooling pathways on the sides of the front and top panels and has carefully matched colors across the case, available in both white and black. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first up, a quick positive update for the community. There's a lot of bad news in general lately, not just in tech, but also in tech. And so we wanted to open on a positive note here. So any of you who've been watching us for a while now know that we work with a couple different organizations every year. Uh, for example, Eden Reforestation Project, and we worked with Adelaide Koala and Wildlife Hospital last year during the, the bushfires to help raise money for their efforts, and also Cat Angels. And Cat Angels reached out to us recently to just offer a huge thank you for the support from our community over the last year from you all when we started doing some uh, charity eBay sales for them where we would sell cool, unique things like autographed, unpopulated PCBs from Kingpin, for example, listed some of those on eBay and did 100% of the proceeds from that going to benefit Cat Angels. We did a couple other things for them too. And we actually first started working with them in 2019 in December when we built them a cat-themed PC. And uh, that was using one of, actually one of those cases that's behind me over there. So Cat Angels is a local no-kill cat shelter. Uh, I've personally visited it a couple times and we took a lot of footage there previously. We think they do great work and they're entirely volunteer driven, really lean budget and all of it goes towards the cause. So we're happy to support them. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because they sent uh, me an email basically asking us to share it with you all. And we haven't even done any specific charity drives or events for them recently. They just, I guess, have seen a, uh, a, a latent impact, a latent positive impact to their operations from the community and from you all. So let me share that with you. First of all, they sent us some photos. We'll, we'll put those on the screen. Those are very important. And Cat Angels emailed us and said that the impact from uh, the support of the PC hardware community for them specifically is disproportionately large just because of how the operation is so small and focused on doing only the cause. They emailed us to say that actually some of our viewers have visited to adopt cats and kittens, which is awesome, and that they've received donations from all over the world since we started working with them for our cat-themed PC build that we did for the shelter in 2019. So Cat Angels is telling us that they always know when the donations are from our community because they're not just local, they're from all over the place. They said this, uh, I just wanted to check in after the holidays and send a very special thanks to you and your community because Gamers Nexus community members have sent us so many gifts and have been applying to adopt from us. We've been able to rescue and adopt out more kittens recently. Here's an update on a few of them and they attached the photos. We're incredibly grateful for your support. Even your smallest mentions garner a huge impact on Cat Angels. And we'll go ahead and put the rest of the email up on the screen too with the message from them in case you want to pause and read it. It's all very positive, which is a nice change and uh, something that this community can be proud of in between all of the bickering about which GPU vendor is the most evil at any given time. So good job, community. We, we done good on this one. All right, let's move on to the next story. The first major news story is in PC component news. So this is AMD's RX 6700 XT officially announced, or rather to, to get this really correct, the RX 6700 XT announcement was officially announced. That's right. The announcement for the announcement uh, said that the announcement will be on March 3rd. So AMD will be <laughs> announcing the RX 6700 XT on March 3rd. There's no further information at this time at all. Uh, and this will be the fourth card in the RX 6000 series. So to recap, the 6900 XT is $1,000, 6800 XT MSRP is $700, and the 6800 non-XT is about $500. $8,570, something like that. 
uh, of course, the prices are all made up and don't matter. And that's just because the, the just like every other GPU and CPU, the products aren't really there to be found. But that's the plan for 6700 XE. We'll be covering it. It's supposed to be revealed at 11 a.m. Eastern time on March 3rd. And the launch will be at a later date. But that's the reveal. As for what was shown, this was posted by AMD's Twitter account where they had a couple of renders of the card. And sometimes the renders are representative of what's actually coming out. Uh, sometimes, though, they do partner-only launches, and there is no part, there is no reference card. They just show one off in renders, and that it doesn't come to fruition. This probably will be a reference model card, as in there will probably be a reference cooler. And if it looks like the one in the renders, then it's basically a, a revamped, slightly facelifted version of the existing reference coolers out there. The next topic is more of a YouTube platform issue, but it does affect someone in our reviewer community, and it's an important issue. It's a good reminder to everyone who makes a living on YouTube and publishes content here. So uh, Hardware Unboxed recently posted on its community page on YouTube that it was effectively shadow banned by YouTube following, quote, suspicious activity. And uh, that suspicious activity could either be YouTube's new stash detection algorithm or a mistake, like a false positive. Or it could actually be suspicious, but they didn't, uh, Hardware Unboxed team didn't see anything that jumped out at them. So the Hardware Unboxed YouTube community page has full details on this, and you can read that. Uh, we'll put it up on the screen briefly if you want to get fully up to date. But we spoke with Steve and Tim from the team, and we're also in contact with our own YouTube rep. Not sure how helpful that's going to be, but trying to give them as many points of contact as they can get to get this resolved quickly. So put them in touch with our rep. They're in touch with some people from YouTube. And since Hardware Unboxed is limited on its ability to reach its own audience right now, because of the nature of the issue, which we'll go over in a second, uh, we wanted to bring some light to this problem and try to reach some of their audience on their behalf. So if you're not aware what's going on, Hub's videos at the time of filming, hopefully this is resolved by the time it goes live, but we'll see. At the time of filming this video, uh, their videos are not visible in the YouTube search results page. If you search Hardware Unboxed, you'll see the newest video is about two months old, December of 2020. And also not visible via notifications. It doesn't look like they're going out. And then recommended, it doesn't seem like they're appearing in either. That leaves basically one avenue, and that's going to be through, or two avenues, through embeds externally, or through uh, just going to their channel directly. Now, this also happened right when Steve from Hardware Unbox was trying to take a couple week vacation. So definitely really feel for him right now. That's an extremely stressful time to have this happen. And I'm sure he's uh, ever appreciative of YouTube's handling of it. But uh, bad timing, they, as I understand it, were planning to come back to the RTX 3060 review at a later date anyway because of that vacation. But with the way it all happened, uh, the channel is currently holding its videos from what they were saying because there's not really much point in publishing them right now because it's going to go out to an extremely limited audience that basically directly seeks out those videos on their page, not even just through search results, because they don't show up there, at least not right now. Either way, he's going to need another vacation right after this one ends. Hub said that this is a YouTube protection mechanism to try and protect the channel from, quote, suspicious activity. Hub has noted that it has confidence in its account security, it's taken extra measures to ensure that it's secure, and it's asked YouTube for specifics on what the words suspicious activity actually mean so that Hub can investigate it further. But YouTube has thus far been slow and unhelpful in its correspondence from what we've seen. We've seen some lunatics on Reddit as well jump into some really crazy conspiracy theories about NVIDIA and AMD. Of course, they're behind it. They're behind everything. Uh, so just to be clear, this is almost certainly a matter of one of YouTube's many automated systems doing something incorrectly, misreading a situation. It is not like Jensen Huan sent out an email to the YouTube C-suite and asked them to, to shadow ban Hardware and Box. If that happened, super impressive. And I hope Steve and Tim from Hardware Unboxed print that and put it on their wall somewhere. But that's not how it happened. So it's very likely that this is a mechanism that's in place where if it sees some sort of uh, suspicious login, so there's, there's two people in different locations logging in, if there's a VPN involved, something like that might trigger this. And the idea is that it starts to restrict the amount of damage that can be done to the channel by an unauthorized agent accessing the channel. So that's a, a good idea. But the problem 
is not protecting the channel from what could be unauthorized access. The problem is, as ever, YouTube gives extremely limited resources to try and resolve these types of issues. And uh, believe it or not, a lot of us don't really have a good YouTube contact. At Linus' size, you get a good contact, but for the most part, we're going through support ticket systems just like you might if you're RMA and a dead product. And uh, that's a problem. So that's what they're dealing with right now. Uh, I have full confidence that Hub's team can, can get this handled and get in contact with the right people uh, and get it dealt with, but that doesn't change the fact that it's an extremely stressful thing to have to deal with. As for our thoughts on this, now, uh, this is very much a, a who's next situation in terms of, again, if it's, if it's all automated stuff just going awry, it can happen to anybody. And that's kind of scary. This is the nature of using someone else's platform. They don't have to host us. They don't have to give us rev share. So everyone takes that risk when they sign up because you're signing up for a platform that gives you more reach and generates everyone some kind of revenue or steady viewership or whatever. But it's a risk that obviously, it, it makes you sort of think when you see situations like this with Hub specifically, it certainly made me think, hmm, maybe I really need to sit down and plan out that website redesign I've been wanting to do and get a, a good rebuilt modern website up so that we have uh, a good backup, not the one that's sort of band-aided in place right now. And, um, and so that you have ways to deal with stuff like this. As for what Hub is doing right now, so they said they're holding publication of videos temporarily until it's fully resolved. Hopefully it's resolved when this news video goes up. Uh, Hub said that its channel performance predictably has fallen off a cliff because of this. They tweeted out a sort of a preview of the viewership just tanking immediately because uh, they stopped showing up in search results. Really important place to show up. And uh, they're working on it. We're trying to help them to the extent we can, but I've got like one contact at YouTube and that's kind of it. So um, we can always call on the big guns and, and get Linus if there's no resolution anytime soon. So it's been a wake-up call. Definitely that it's time to sort of spec out and fix the old website. I guess if you're an extremely talented web developer, uh, especially with someone who can turn our PNG charts into charts that are all handled in a database and are hover over bars that are interactive, reach out to us. We might be especially interested right now. No guarantee we'll reply to everybody, but uh, especially interested right now because of this reminder. Uh, you can check Hub's Twitter feed and their YouTube community page for updates as they occur. Uh, again, Steve is currently on vacation, but Tim is handling a lot of this stuff. So uh, we've got, got confidence in Tim and the stash to get it resolved. Next story, a Taiwan literal drought affecting the silicon drought. Taiwan's been facing a sort of unique climate crisis that is entangled with silicon production. Currently, the island has seen a great reduction in both typhoons and annual rainfall. And like the weather in Texas that shut down semiconductor plants a couple of weeks ago, this is influencing or has the potential to influence silicon production in Taiwan. For the first time in more than half a century, not a single typhoon landed on Taiwan in 2020. Taiwan's water levels in several reservoirs are at or below 20%, and the government has requested that companies like TSMC and UMC reduce water usage by 7% to 11%. As Taiwan implements greater water restrictions, those foundries, again, TSMC, USMC, and VIS, are trucking in water to the fabs on the island. According to Reuters, shipmakers based in Taiwan have been able to stave off reductions in production thus far by importing their water. Foundries typically recycle and reuse a great portion of their wastewater, and Taiwan has particularly strict environmental laws. We've seen those firsthand in our factory tours, in Taipei. An extended period of this water shortage, though, could certainly intensify an already pervasive global semiconductor shortage. Up next, HP has agreed to acquire HyperX, which is Kingston's actually long-standing gaming offshoot brand. It's working on an acquisition of everything except for the memory and the NAND segment, and that's mostly peripherals. HP will buy HyperX from Kingston for $425 million, with an expected closing date landing sometime in second quarter of 2021, pending regulatory approval. The caveat, however, is that HP is only acquiring those HyperX peripherals. Kingston will retain the HyperX NAND Flash and DRAM segment. We're not sure yet if one of them will rename the branding, probably so though. The press release is somewhat sparse on how the deal will play out, but presumably HyperX will exist alongside HP's Omen line, 
rather than be folded into it, which HP has done unsuccessfully in the past. Kingston spawned the HyperX brand back in 2002 with its inaugural memory tester and DDR400 modules. The company has expanded that brand into headsets, microphones, keyboards, mice, console accessories, and all kinds of stuff we've seen at trade shows over the years. HP will be using the brand to gain a better foothold in the ever-growing gaming market, assuming that it doesn't consume and digest the brand altogether. Up next, Fry's Electronics closing down. After about 36 years, Fry's Electronics is closing its doors. Uh, Fry's opened for business back in 1985, and it was a premier location for PC building, PC components, and electronics in general. Fry's, when I visited it, always felt like sort of a Barnes & Noble of computers, where they would often have a cafe inside, but then they went the extra length of theming the store. So, can't remember where it was, maybe it was in Las Vegas, but there's an Aztec-themed store. There's a music-themed store that I went to in Austin. A couple others, in Palo Alto, for example, there's a Western or a cowboy-inspired one. In uh, Campbell, there's an Egyptian-themed store. So it's an interesting chain. Perhaps these themes are part of why uh, they've had financial issues. But the reports flooded the internet that the company was shuttering in the past week or so and Fry's ended up confirming it after people ran into error 504s when visiting the Fry's Electronics website. Fry's Electronics said, quote, after nearly 36 years in business as the one-stop shop and online resource for high-tech professionals across nine states and 31 stores, Fry's Electronics Inc., or Fry's or company, has made the difficult decision to shut down its operations and close its business permanently as a result of the changes in the retail industry and the challenges posed by the pandemic. The company will implement the shutdown through an orderly wind-down process that it believes will be in the best interests of the company, its creditors, and other stakeholders. And just to be really clear here, there's really no better time to be or have been an electronics retailer. If you haven't noticed, it's been pretty hard to get components. They don't really stay on the shelves. But this has been a while coming. And in fact, if you needed any evidence that this isn't just because of 2020, Bitwit Kyle did a video in January of 2020 uh, showing how barren Fry's had become. He flew out to a Fry's Electronics specifically to look at the empty shelves. And it was actually brilliant. It's pretty cool content. I would encourage checking it out. So this comes after customers have been posting images of the barren store shelves for quite a while. And the writing's been on the wall for, for a couple of years at this point. The Verge says that a former Fry's employee uh, said that Samsung stopped doing business with Fry's as a result of outstanding bills as well. Fry's was known for those themed stores and for PC parts. And in the wake of the news, there's been quite a few articles memorializing Fry's Electronics, if it has positive memories for you. 3DFX in the news now, sort of. So this happened about 10 days ago. But uh, we decided to just pick it up and run it in this video because it's interesting and we missed it the first time. So by the time 3DFX reached its Voodoo 5 line of GPUs, back when there were more GPU vendors out there, it was facing a lot of pressure from competing GPUs that offered better performance at the time or had better marketing or a mixture of both. One of those was NVIDIA's GeForce 2 line. That's right. We weren't always in the thousands for product names. And uh, the other one was ATI's Radeon R100 GPUs. The Voodoo 5 6000 of the era was meant to be something of a last ditch effort to put out some serious competition. From early reports of its performance, it looked impressive and early testing showed that the GPU had potential. But the Voodoo 5 6000 wasn't a cheap or simple card to produce and sell. The Voodoo 5 6000 was based on the 3DFX VSA-100 chip, and the main principle of these chips was scalability. VSA was literally an abbreviation for Voodoo Scalable Architecture. The idea was that multiple VSA-100 chips would work in parallel on a single board, and the pixel fill rate would increase in a commensurate way. The Voodoo 4 4500 used one VSA-100, while the Voodoo 5 5000 or 5500 used two VSA-100 chips. The Voodoo 5 6000 would eventually use four VSA-100 chips. Packing four separate dies onto a single board meant that the PCB for the Voodoo 5 6000 was very complicated for the year 2000. The card itself also far exceeded what an AGP slot could power. So the cards required a separate and supplemental power connector, uh, branded as a, the Voodoo Volts. And all this is to say that due to prohibitive costs coupled with 3DFX's already existing financial woes, the Voodoo 5 6000 never made it to market. 3DFX produced around 1,000 units and was working on pre-production sampling, and they're increasingly hard and expensive to find. 
However, a modder and enthusiast has reverse engineered the Voodoo 5 6000 and produced a rather faithful recreation of the GPU. And we'll show their forum thread with their work log on the screen if you'd like to visit it and uh, give them kudos. The reincarnated Voodoo 5 6000 features four VSA100 chips, which can still be bought today actually for around 20 bucks online. The reimagined Voodoo 5 6000 also uses 16 8 megabyte SD RAM modules for a total of 128 megabytes of video memory, or 32 megabytes per VSA100 per the original spec. The modified V5 6000 does offer a few more modern features though, such as a custom black PCB and four pin Molex power on the board itself, so no external power supply or voodoo volts is needed. In the last couple of news videos, there's been this topic of silicon manufacturing independence as countries have come to realize and embrace how important this is to the future. And much like in the US and China over the last uh, couple of weeks or months we've been talking about this, Europe and the EU is now looking into establishing its own certain amount of sovereignty as it relates to semiconductor and silicon manufacturing. So like other parts of the world, Europe currently relies heavily on Taiwan for a lot of its silicon and supply of chips that it uses for enterprises like 5G and automotive, the latter of which was heavily influenced in the last couple of months. And according to reports uh, by Bloomberg and other outlets, the European Union is mulling the idea of building semiconductor manufacturing facilities in Europe at this point, and the project would involve TSMC and Samsung. By bringing more domestic production online and building out local supply chains, Europe could wean itself off of the US or Asia for supply, as well as drastically increase its contribution to the global supply of chips and semiconductors. Currently, Europe accounts for less than 10% of global chip production. That does include global foundries, which has had fabs in Germany for a long time but it hopes to eventually produce at least 20% of the world's semiconductors. Currently, the EU is investigating avenues in which it could produce chips built between 10 nanometers and 3 nanometers, and possibly down to 2 nanometers. This comes as the world is grappling with global chip shortages, and that ripple effect has extended to the automotive industry heavily based in Europe. And as Bloomberg reports, Volkswagen recently lost tens of thousands of vehicles that were in production due to chip supply constraints, or in the very least, they hit slowdowns that affected production. The next story is an interesting report from Semiconductor Engineering, which explores interconnect and packaging technology, and is specifically looking at how interconnects are becoming a significant limiter on transistor scaling and on process technology. So the report outlines how problems with interconnects began at 20 nanometers, and continued at 16 and 14 nanometer process nodes for advanced chips. The problem lies within the copper used for interconnects, according to semiconductor engineering. As transistors shrink, the copper vias that serve as interconnects also have to shrink, and as copper gets smaller, the amount of current that can get pushed through it gets smaller as the resistance increases. According to the report, manufacturers have succeeded in scaling interconnects to 7 nanometers and even 5 nanometers but it's becoming exponentially more challenging with each node migration. Quote, with successive generations, these local interconnects have become both narrower and closer together to the point where the incumbent copper interconnects are facing significant challenges to further scaling. For example, further decreases to the line width or height would dramatically increase the electrical resistance of the line, as stated by the Director of University Engagements at LAM Research. Currently, the copper dual damascene process is the standard for chip makers, and it seems the technology will get chip makers down to 3 nanometers. However, for 2 nanometers and beyond, the new interconnect technology and process will be needed to maintain transistor scaling. Semiconductor engineering lists a few of the most promising methods currently in R&D, they say that one of them is hybrid metallization or prefill, another is semi damascene, and another is supervious, which they say is a graphene interconnect alongside other technologies. And all these are in R&D uh, as the industry continues to look for a replacement metal for copper, says Semiconductor Engineering. All these methods come with their own assortment of challenges and chip makers will look for preservation of the life of copper dual damascene for as long as possible. Additionally, advanced packaging techniques are actively being explored to help continue pushing the development of advanced chips. Finally, in other news, we have two stories. One is about storage technology, hard drives. Another one is about Gigabyte's servers. Starting with Gigabyte, the company announced its new G262ZR02U server rack. The most notable aspect of this is that it's among the first servers to incorporate NVIDIA's HGX A100 GPU, and the server can be configured with up to four of them. Elsewhere, the G262ZR0 uses two AMD Epic 7002 series CPUs 
and can be outfitted with up to 4 terabytes of DDR4 3200 megahertz via the 16 DIMMs. Gigabyte states that the 262ZR0 is aimed at HPC, AI, and data analytics. Gigabyte didn't disclose pricing or availability, uh, and it's one of those request quote pages, which are always scary. Moving on, Toshiba announced its first hard drive that makes use of energy-assisted magnetic recording. Specifically, Toshiba is using Flux Control Microwave Assisted Magnetic Recording, or FCMAMR, as aerial density and capacity increase, the bit area decreases, and the bits become unstable and incapable of maintaining or changing their magnetic polarity with PMR, or perpendicular magnetic recording, according to Toshiba, and this is why they're moving this direction. And the result of this is that hard drive makers are moving on to other recording media, such as MAMR, while also developing HAMR, or HAMR, or Heat Assisted Magnetic Recording. Toshiba's 18 terabyte MG09 uses nine helium uh, sealed platters and 18 read and write heads that use microwaves to alter the disk's magnetic polarity before writing the data. The 18 terabyte MG09 is aimed at cloud scale and data center applications and is expected to be sampled to select customers by end of March 2021. That's it for hardware news for the week. Thanks for watching. As always, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to help us out directly. Subscribe for more, and we'll see you all next time.